What's up guys, it's Doll Matter here, and today we are going to be reacting to a new channel. This is J He Box, J H E Box, I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it. They're a small channel. Uh, they've only got about 1.8k subs, but so go check them out. But despite that, this video actually has like 300,000 views, so uh, I was recommended to check this out. This is Fake Oranges and the End of Trading Places Explained. So Trading Places, obviously the uh, 1980s Eddie Murphy movie, very good movie. I haven't seen it in years, but uh, I watched it when I was a kid and I remember it being really good. Uh, so anyway, link to the original video down below. Be sure to check him out. He's a small creator and uh, yeah, let's jump into it. It's almost Christmas, and what better way to combine getting festive and staying in your homes than watching a Christmas film? But wait, I hear you cry. There are so many to choose from. And that is true, you've got your Home Alones and your black and white ones and your sentient snow people, but in my mind, one film comes above the rest as the most Christmassy. By com for, for me, it's uh, the one I watch all the time is The Grinch. Um, like the... Uh... The, I, I can't remember who made it. I don't know if it was Disney or Warner Brothers or whatever. It's the one with Jim Carrey. So uh, That movie's so good. And then another one that's really good is The Nightmare Before Christmas, which I know people always argue, is that a Halloween movie or a Christmas movie? Um, I, well, I think it applies to both, but two, the reason it's definitely a Christmas movie is we don't really do this anymore, but there used to be an old English tradition of telling ghost stories on Christmas, so it actually fits in with that old English tradition. But anyway. Combining festive cheer and rampant capitalism. That's right, it's Trading Places. And why not? I mean, it's funny, it has a moral message, there's nudity <laughs> for some reason, except there is I mean, it's one a movie. small problem with it, and that's this. Oh, the old stock exchange. Where, if you haven't spent the last few years on Wall Street bets, you may not know what's actually going on in this, the pinnacle of this film's climactic conclusion. Well, fear not, because I, someone with no qualifications in finance but a lot of responsibilities to ignore, am here to <laughs> put it down for you. Oh yeah, and spoilers ahead I guess, but I mean, the title says the end of Trading Places will be explained in this video, so I'm not really sure what else you expected. But first, a recap. If you're also, who hasn't seen that movie by now? I guess maybe if you're like some young kid, but that's like an iconic... 1980s comedy, right? I mean, I guess anything with Eddie Murphy is, but... Tension span can't handle that. Skip to this timestamp. The film follows Louis Winthorpe III and Billy Ray Valentine, played by Ray and Donkey respectively, who live at polar opposite ends of 80s Philadelphian society. Valentine is a homeless con man, whilst Winthorpe lives it up as a wealthy commodities trader. He's got a... You know the number one thing that this movie reminds me of? And, I, and, I, and I'm reminded by this whenever I see, like, a movie from, like, the 80s, the 90s, or even the early 2000s, is how you really rarely see East Coast cities in movies anymore. It's always California. It like it's very very rare, especially like upper class East Coast life. If there is East Coast life, it's almost always a gangster movie. Right? You never see, like this is something that like when I was a kid, this was like really common. Um, and now it's just like non-existent almost. At all, a big house, a slave, and a role working for the Duke brothers, two millionaire megalomaniacs who make a bet as to whether a person acts in accordance with their personality or their environment. Nature versus nurture, if you will. To test this, they frame Winthorpe for drug possession and give everything he owns to Valentine, from his house to his job, to see if the both of them will start acting differently. Anyway, hilarity ensues, Winthorpe becomes violent and depressed, it turns out a con man is actually pretty good at financial trading, and the brothers soon decide to end the bet. But not before Valentine overhears the brothers' scheme and sets out on a mission of revenge, which ultimately culminates in the confusing stock market scene. So let's break that down. First, the setting. Winthorpe and Valentine arrive at the World Trade Center to trade futures, specifically orange juice futures. So my first question was, what the hell is an orange juice future? <laughs> Essentially, a future is a contract to buy or sell a thing for a fixed price at some point in the future. And in our case, this happens to be 15,000 pounds of frozen concentrated orange juice. So how do they work? Well, imagine a farmer has an orange crop that will conveniently yield 15,000 pounds of orangey goodness, but they're worried that by harvest time the price will drop. So they want to guarantee that their oranges will be sold at a reasonable price. On the other side, an orange juice manufacturer is worried that the price of oranges might rise by the time the crops are ready, and paying more than necessary isn't very cash money of you, so both parties decide to enter into an FCOJ futures contract, with one side buying and the other side selling at a fixed price. 
It doesn't matter if the real world price goes up or down, this is the price that both sides have agreed to pay for in the future. So, if by harvest time the price of oranges has actually risen, then the manufacturer will have saved some money and the farmer will have lost some potential profit. Whereas, if the price falls, it's the farmer who will be in the money and the manufacturer who is spending more than they have to. What's this got to do with the movie? The what? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Just a Wall Street well, Bets video we now. What looked at isn't normally done by farmers and manufacturers, no, but rather by institutional investors on their behalf, who actually yeah. do intend to exchange physical oranges for money. However, like most farmers, Winthorpe and Valentine don't actually intend to go and pick up any of the oranges after their busy day. They're simply trading these contracts with other traders, hoping that when they make a futures contract as a buyer, the price will go up by the time they make another futures contract as a seller where they can pocket the difference. So, for most of the traders, these oranges may as well be imaginary, because unless you have an orange farm or a factory, owning the contracts and selling them on is far more valuable than the oranges they represent. And so, the traders are essentially passing fake oranges all the way from one side of the chain to the other, hoping to make a profit along the way before they get cashed in for real oranges. Okay, so, back to the film. Winthorpe and Valentine are going to trade fake oranges with other traders, including the Dukes, but why? Well, the Dukes hired a stereotypical shady man to steal a government harvest report telling them if the orange crop would have been damaged by the winter weather. <laughs> I love how you need to, you need, like, this is like the most, like, useless thing to steal ever, because you would just know, right? This would be something that, like, would be on the news. People would be talking about this. <laughs> I feel like they could have done, like, a, be a much better job of, like, showing illegal industrial espionage and insider trading but whatever you know it's a comedy movie who cares if the crop has been damaged then there will be fewer oranges for the rest of the year and the price of frozen orange juice will go up anyway if you've seen the film you know the drill the gang find the guy sexually enslave him to a gorilla <laughs> be fine and give the dukes a fake report saying the crop was damaged the dukes therefore think the price is going to rise and so instruct their stock nerd to keep buying fake oranges no matter what, so that when they go to sell them in another futures contract, the price will be higher and they can pocket the difference. But of course, everyone here, who by the way were actual stock traders who were asked to be extras in the film, starts to notice when the millionaire renowned traders are doing nothing but buying. So they start to buy too, and before long everyone is buying, pushing the price up and up. Which is where the next piece of stock market slang comes in. Because when the price of oranges reaches 142 cents per pound... When you know what's funny? I'm pretty sure this is illegal on both sides, right? Like, you have the, the whole industrial espionage, attempt at insider trading situation on the one side. And then on the other side, you have market manipulation, which is also, I believe, technically illegal. The, the thing with, like, a lot of these laws is they're, they're illegal, but, like, they're so hard to prove. And a lot of the people that are doing this kind of stuff are incredibly wealthy and powerful. So unless it affects somebody else who is incredibly wealthy or powerful or the government, it rarely ever gets enforced. One, because it's difficult to enforce, and two, because the people doing it are generally kind of above the law, right? Like it's – think of like all the government officials who are worth millions or hundreds of millions of dollars despite the fact that they work a job that pays $200,000 a year. It's the only job they've ever had and they have no family inheritance and yet somehow they're worth $100 million, right? Like, Yeah. Winthorpe and Valentine start selling short. Which basically means that Winthorpe and Valentine promise to sell, uh... I think that was 2,000? Hard to tell. But assuming it was, that would be 2,000 contracts worth of orange juice at 142 cents per pound in the future. But everyone in the room thinks that the price will keep going up. So if they buy a contract now at 142 cents per pound, they can sell it as another contract later for a big profit. So they buy. And from the looks of it, everyone buys. But here's the problem. Winthorpe and Valentine don't actually have any fake oranges to sell. So what they're doing is selling short, which basically means what they're selling isn't even fake oranges, but rather an IOU for fake oranges. <laughs> they're selling something now, which they plan to buy later. But of course, if the price went up when everyone started buying, now that Winthorpe and Valentine are selling in such huge quantities of oranges, the price starts to creep down. But no one cares because the harvest report is going to be bad, right? Well, no. When the actual crop report gets announced, all at once everyone realizes that actually there'll be loads of oranges by it. Oh, okay, so they were trying to get the information early then. I didn't realize that. Okay, so that, that makes a lot more sense. Because I was going to say, all this stuff is like available to the public, but that makes a lot more sense that they were trying to get that information early. April. 
and so they won't be worth as much as everyone thought, which is where the tables turn. Everyone who was so eager to buy now realizes that the really expensive fake oranges they just bought won't be worth very much at all in the future, as the price falls down to 46 cents by itself, and they're desperate to sell them at as high a price as they can to minimize their losses. So this is where Winthorpe and Valentine start buying the fake oranges they sold earlier, because they need to actually get some to sell at the price they promised. Otherwise, that chain of fake oranges will make it to a manufacturer at some point who will be expecting some real oranges, at which point they better have some to sell or they better get farming. As the price continues to drop, Winthorpe and Valentine buy their oranges cheaper and cheaper as people become more and more desperate to get rid of their expensive ones, until eventually, when the price hits 29 cents, they've bought back the amount they sold earlier, meaning they're safe and can deliver on all their previous sales. So, because the contracts they made at the start sold fake oranges between 142 and 102 cents per pound, and by the end they were buying these fake oranges for between 46 and 29 cents per pound, and remember, they sold 2,000 contracts where each FCOJ contract is for 15,000 pounds of oranges, they made, let's see here, uh, 122 minus 38 cents per pound, times 15,000 pounds, times 2,000 contracts, equals $25.2 million. Goddamn. Meanwhile, the Dukes are stood holding tickets for millions of pounds of oranges which they bought but couldn't sell, meaning that, in theory, they're entitled to convert those fake oranges into real oranges and receive a delivery of millions of them whenever they want. But in reality, given that they need to earn back, uh, how much? $394 million in cash? Goddamn. They'll probably just go bankrupt instead. So there you have it. That's what actually happened. A lot of fucking oranges. Christmas film. Of course. Is there even three hundred million dollars worth of oranges grown a year? I mean, I guess probably. Right. Yeah. I. I, I wonder what. What do you, I'm gonna Google that. How? What do I even? How many dollar amount of oranges grown annually? Um. Oh, the U.S. alone produces $984 million, or did in the 2022-2023 year. So, yeah, I guess there's other – in this well, – that's also accounting for inflation. Um, but, yeah, I guess if the, if the states alone is producing just shy of a billion dollars of oranges, and I'm assuming most oranges are grown outside of the states because not the entire, the entire states isn't tropical, then, uh, yeah, there's got to be a lot of fucking money in oranges. The film is definitely a product of its time, and Tumblr wouldn't be too happy with some of the jokes, like this one. Then these dudes are a couple of <laughs> here, huh? Or this. <laughs> Lionel! From the African Education Conference, right? <laughs> I love it, but Justin Trudeau's it's an face Christmas over. It's comedy starring Eddie Murphy, which uses frozen orange juice to teach people about stocks and racism. What's not to love? It's honestly oh, yeah, a great and movie. Just so you know, don't try this at home. There are actually a lot of safeguards in place to protect this sort of volatility, and in real life trading would have been prematurely ended to let the market stabilize. Also, using insider information like this to predict the market is called insider trading, and unless you're rich, it's illegal. But hey, when does that- uh, I love how he has a little caveat, unless you're rich, it's illegal. Yeah, r rich or politically connected, because um, yeah, again, like you see people do this all the time and they never, like, uh, think of all the US senators. Yeah, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, U.S. Senator trading sentiment alongside S&P 500. So yeah, look at the amount. So this is uh, weekly net stock purchases, uh, S&P. So yeah, this is just basically showing how much U.S. Senators make more than the S&P 500, which is like unheard of. Ever stop some people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's honestly crazy how many U.S. Senators are worth like, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars despite not coming from money. And I, I, what's the U.S. senator paid? U.S. senator uh, income, I guess. Uh, $174,000, right? So you're paid just shy of two hundred grand a year, and yet you're worth $300 million, and you don't come from money? Kind of questionable. But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.